Hello, this is Chipper Khan, and this is The Otherworldly, the Wednesday night show for Changing Times, Changing Worlds, a conference coming up in November. Uh, and between then, we have, we have uh, nights once a, once a week where you can see what we, the kind of thing we do at the conference, only at the conference, we do it all day long, all weekend long. Only since it's going to be virtual this year, we're going to be doing it um, the Monday through Friday evenings and then Saturday and Sunday all day long. Our guest tonight is Carenza Roberts, who has an ancient machine and therefore has no camera on it. So you're going to have to listen to the cool things he has to say, but you won't be able to see his face. Either that or he's very, very private. I'm not sure which. <laughs> but, Hi, Carenza. Say hello so they can hear your voice. Hello. And there it is an go. ancient machine that's 16 years old. So mm -hmm. uh, its operations are limited. But tonight, what we are talking about is what I refer to as the Cunningham effect, although I'm not sure how many other people do, is when people, once they get a system that satisfies them, they don't move beyond it. And uh, yes, it's wonderful when you first start to learn, but you have to, then you have to use trial and error. You have to freaking use science. Uh, not enough people incorporate science in their magical practice. And I know that uh, Star Wolf does. I know Carenza does. I know a lot of people who do, and I think it works better. So um, toward the end, we can ask the rest of people what you, what may be bugging you about other people and how they practice, but start, let's, Carissa, you're the guest star tonight. So, so how about you, you take it from here and then. Well, I am going to go out on a limb and assume that everyone is familiar with the Earth Children's series, Clan of the Cave Bear. Yeah, sort of, kind of. Kind of, at least. And I'm going to go with some imagery from there for very ancient magical practices, such as we see at one point at the clan gathering in the first book that there is the amazing flute playing that is so magical. Mm -hmm. And one of the reason it is so magical is no one knows how the sound is made. They don't understand how the bull roarer makes a sound. And to boil that down, any advanced technology is or becomes magic when it is inaccessible or incomprehensible to the viewers and the users. Mm -hmm. And when we go back to the ancient times, none of these things were natural. They were all supernatural in that they did not occur normally in the environment ceramics they never walked along and found a little statuette just naturally occurring it was a magical process and we first see it in the archaeological record as void of offerings little statues that we interpret as being religious or ritual uses um copper when copper is first shows up in the archaeological record we see it as ceremonial objects, frequently axes, and anyone who has ever worked with even work hardened copper, you know, it's entirely too soft to be an axe. So, why do we see so many obvious copper axes other than magical use? It's a magical process. And having witnessed copper oozing out of copper ore in a fire, it is an incredible 
it's just there. And another object that we find very, very common these days that was extremely magical for our ancestors when it was discovered is glass. We don't give it a second thought now, but when we first look at glass in the archeological record, we are seeing little statuettes, jewelry items, talismans. We don't see bowls. Same with ceramics. Bowls and pots don't show up until much later in the archeological record. Another great example is we have records from Greece and it's probably a much older process is the use of mold and or honey on infected wounds. Science can explain every bit of this and no one thinks of making a ceramic bowl as a magical process now, even though our ancestors would have. So originally the very magical was we did not understand the why it was supernatural simply because we didn't have the context. This has led people to think that as soon as we understand the context, it's explained it's not magic. And to bring in what Chippegon had been mentioning with Cunningham, Cunningham did a lot of really awesome work, a lot of great correspondence tables. And then he did some things that really did stop people from thinking it's real. The statements of you have to use natural materials. We don't really have anything on this planet that is made of anything that does not appear on the periodic table. There are a few object, a uh, few elements on the periodic table that were th theoretical that we have now manufactured in a lab that lasted nanoseconds. No one is making anything with those elements. But anything else you can touch, you can hold, you can interact with, it is made entirely of elements from the periodic table simply because we do not have anything else to work with. So the, oh, you have to use organic cotton. This really is pushing the thought that you can have something that does not at its source go back to natural resources. And we don't have anything of that sort. And that is very limiting for people. We also see with the correspondence tables, people never go beyond those in entirely too many cases simply because it's easy. They don't have to think about it. They don't have to consider, I want to do something for business success. Well, I can use green because there it is for prosperity and something Jupiter for business, cinnamon works, and voila, dress that candle and we're good to go and we don't have to put any more thought into it. And the reasoning behind the correspondence tables, the way they're set up and the reasoning for saying natural materials is to change your emotional response to the materials you're using. When you change your emotional response, it helps you change the brain waves, how your mind is working, how you respond, how you react. And the reason to change something when it's working is something else may work better for you. It may speak better for you, it may resonate more with you, and it may have a greater effect 
on your brain waves. And the reason this is important, and we're going to go back to Clan of the Cave Bear and all of these ceremonies around the firelight that we picture in the prehistoric world with very bright colors and masks, painted bodies in the fire, firelight and the building of emotional responses. And that's important because in a group, magic tends to happen at the very fastest brain waves. You start, when you start reaching beta gamma waves, that is when your body starts producing endorphins, which create an altered state of mind. The other time you get a altered state of mind is when you get down to theta and delta. So the two extremes and how the mind works is when you get into a magical state. And why change what materials you're using? If a different material, a different process is letting you get to a theta or a delta state easier, it's going to just be more effective for you. And this takes us back to the um, how you feel about it and the natural. And there are many things that are so obviously natural, even by very, very limited explanations that I hear people again and again say they can't stand because it's unnatural. Concrete, for instance, which is cement, gravel, sand, water. And cement is made with calcium, silicon, aluminum, iron, a few other things. It's sourced from things like limestone, shells, chalk, shale, clay, slate, sand, iron ore. It is not inherently unworldly, artificial. These are, it's all made from stuff that occur in the natural environment. But again and again and again, you will hear people go off on how it saps their energy and they can't work with it and they have so many problems without ever actually investigating. It's just in their mind and it will never work for them. They're never going to be happy with it simply because of how they respond to it. And this has gone from any very advanced technology is magical when it's inaccessible and incomprehensible in the ancient world to now when something is inaccessible or incomprehensible, we just don't understand it. We immediately go to it's artificial, it's man-made, it's unnatural, it's bad. Another wonderful example of this is silicone, which is quartz that is heated to 32,072 degrees Fahrenheit to isolate the silicon. It's, the silicon is ground to a fine powder and mixed with methyl chloride and heated. Methyl chloride is CH3Cl, so it's carbon, hydrogen, and chlorine. Then it's processed again with water and heat to remove the chlorine molecule. So you're looking at almost pure silicone or quartz in extremely usable forms. It's a great glue. And Chipagon had comments she wanted to share on that. Yes, I did. I, I remember buying a uh, magic wand once. Now, the wand, of course, is not magic. The magic is what you, you put through the wand. But it was a piece of optical quartz rod with Ooh. a Nice crystal stuff. point on the end and this was secured with um the silicon um glue 
I don't know what you'd call it. And uh, it had it did have a little um, copper collar on it, which was mostly decorative and, and probably supported it better than the glue would all by itself. But damn, did energy, I mean, let's think about what optical quartz is designed for. Passing mm -hmm. energy through without distortion, I have never used a wand that worked better than that. It was amazing, but not, not as cute, not as natural looking as the homemade wooden wands and not as cute as some of the very ornamental ones I've seen with jewels stuck on them. But uh, as a, a tool should first and foremost be functional and boy, that one was. So, well, it's interesting because Melody in her books, Love in the, is in the Earth, makes a big point when talking about the many, many varieties of quartz, distinguishing <clears throat> those that have identical properties when manufactured from those that don't. And I thought it was interesting that there are things. Well, you talk about cement, man-made metamorphic rock. You heat mm. it in a kiln to drive off all the bound water, and then you mix it with water, you get the rock back. So the- I'd see it more is, as sedimentary, actually, but that's- <clears throat> Well- It's an aggregate. Yeah. It still ends up the same way. And yeah. I think the point that the line between natural and unnatural is kind of arbitrary in a lot of ways. I, yes, I suppose you then have to define what is magic. <laughs> going, going back to natural versus unnatural, looking at it and thinking about it, and I have put enormous amounts of thought into this, it seems that usually people, when they're referring to unnatural, they're referring to more processed, more synthesized. And natural being less or occurring without synthesization. And I have a great example for this, and that's going to be raspberry flavoring. Natural raspberry flavoring is made out of castorum which is the secretion of, from the anal gland of a beaver. Mm -hmm. And artificial raspberry flavor is made out of raspberry ketone, which is a chemical isolated from raspberries that now can be synthesized and the molecules made without having to isolate it first inside a raspberry. Out of, two, beaver in the process. out of the two, I certainly would rather put raspberry ketone into my mouth if I know about it. So whether it's how processed it is, and I recently, and I'm going to be doing a review on it, came across the wonderful book, Mystical Stitches, on um, yes. using magic <laughs> and she insists you have to use organic cotton because it's natural and unless you're processing it yourself you're not getting away from technology and processing no matter how organic it says it is no matter how cotton it is and how you respond to it is going to be much more important than whether or not it has the term organic thrown on it. Yeah. And rayon is a wonderful fiber that I consider natural. It's made out of wood cellulose. Mm -hmm. And whether we process it, we're processing the cotton. It's just a matter of degree and how we're processing it. Yep. And well, it's, it's interesting because I think one of the things we get with the, you talk about processing and the natural and unnatural, and I think we, without realizing it, drift over to the concept of food and how 
excessive processing adds a lot of artificial crap and removes the vitality from the food. And I'm not sure if that necessarily applies to inorganic materials. Because <clears throat> I think about, you know, you take oats, all right, rolled oats, minimally processed. And, you know, you can go through there to like Cheerios, which are processed, but not quite it, uh, a little more. But then you see stuff. I read labels that look like a summary of somebody's master's degree thesis in organic chemistry. Yeah. I don't well, think I want to eat that. That is definitely where the personal interaction with the product comes in where you look at it and learn something about it and say, I don't want to use this. Yeah. I'm very aware that oil is a naturally occurring substance and it is made up entirely of elements on the periodic table. I don't like plastics. I don't want to use plastic in my magic. I don't want to embroider with plastic to make a wang of bags. I do not want to wear plastic and I am not cutting up little bits of plastic and making talismans out of it. Simply because it does not work for me. I have seen in the local <laughs> area enormous quantities of runes being made out of plastic resins. I can't say that it doesn't work for other people. I can just say that doesn't work for me. And food is very much the same way. Mm -hmm. As we go to my raspberry <clears throat> flavoring, I personally, I avoid anything. And when I pick it up and look and see natural raspberry flavoring, I go, yep, I'm out of here. And <laughs> we have to do that with everything, we have to decide, is this working for us? Can we use this in our magic? And that's one of the things with these oversimplified rules that we get with the coming to hand effect that is taken away. All these beautiful correspondence, it stops people from thinking about what can I use? What will work for me? What is good for me to use for my magic? And it's just the case. And here we have plastics work for me. Fimo is great for talisman creation. It is yeah. definitely. But I, use it I use it under certain circumstances, including having a special toaster oven set aside just for that. It is completely valid. And I cringe every time I see a, in a book on magical making the you have to use natural organic and they're putting that out because Emo's that's organic. It's not a crystal and it's not a metal <laughs> and it might contain carbon. We don't know. Lots of it. Actually, it's a petrochemical. <laughs> so from a setting plastic. So there we are. And, but people got the idea in their head early on that natural was going to give you the importance, just like the rule that you have to buy everything without that you're going to use for magic without haggling about it. That's to make you think it's important. And for the most part these days, we don't haggle, <laughs> at least in 21st no. century America. <clears throat> Michael's does you not might have shop a around. Yeah, mm. but last time I checked, pretty much every store I deal with, it's take your their price or go someplace else. Pretty much, you know, you it, might be it, able to make a special offer on eBay or something like that, or yeah. at a yard sale. But that's simply so that you feel it's special. And the um story, and I call it a story because I almost completely disregard this as, yep, wishful thinking, that when you buy something, you put energy into using that money. So 
your trading energy in the form of money for your raw material. So it's the same as having put energy into growing your flax with intention and going through the process of soaking and retting it. And I'll buy it my and linen at Joanne's if you don't mind. <laughs> and I don't buy that you're putting the same amount of intention and energy into earning that money as you put into doing that. But I'm also buying my linen. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah and, and well in defense of haggling the one thing i would say for it is that the process of finding out the lowest price that the seller will let go of the stuff for against the highest you're willing to pay for it does allow both of you to refine your concept of what the value is Mm -hmm. And I can't say that's necessarily a bad thing. I just hate haggling. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I make use of Google Foo and clearance sales and things like that to find the things mm -hmm. I need. I also want to point out that we have to remember that the disabled may not have all the options that others have for acquiring materials like yep. flax grown yeah. with full intention and all that. Or and we have to land. get them where we can. Or right. the land, or the or the land, or yeah. right. You know, I'm lucky we have know, a front porch. We don't get use of any yard here where I live. So right, and you know, for me, a big outing is to go to Wegmans. But <clears throat> you know, I I look at the fact that what when we say haggle, I tell Jen we need something, and I let her in essence haggle the entire global market by finding the best price for it from a place we can buy it from. Yeah. So it pre has so the, the disabled have extra qualifications they have to put on what they can acquire. Yeah. One thing I've noticed is there is kind of a little level of snobbish um, elitism in a lot of the you must use this, you must use yeah. that. Oh, well, your, tarot deck, your first tarot deck must be given to you and you mm -hmm. have to wrap it in a silk cloth. Yep. Because that makes you special. Yep. It's Hard all about <laughs> it's all about how you think about it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I like an experience tool. If somebody has used the tool before, unless I'm getting a really nasty vibe off of it, I I figure it's already been trained. It's like you know, getting a pet that's been uh, already that's broken. That's broken. <clears throat> but, mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's why I'm also myself very careful about letting go of things that I've had for a while. Like I turned over all but one of my tarot decks to Jen simply because I knew she would make better use of them than I mm. would because she can actually use them as a tool or I can't. And I mm. kept my small size Crowley deck because I love the artwork so much. Mm. But I was comfortable doing this because I trust her energy and I knew that it would be okay to let her have those. <clears throat> Bill and Jen not sold separately. Yeah, really. <laughs> or as One. you said in the SCA, Jean Guillaume oh. et Jean Vieve non venditit solus. Right. Well, this is Carenza's hour, so so yeah. Yeah. touching back on when we buy something, anytime we buy something, we're divorcing mm -hmm. ourselves more from the process of its creation, whether it be food, magical tools or materials, no matter what it is. And in the past, in the period that many of us really seem to um, almost idolize, people were very much in touch with what they needed to do to get what they needed to live, whether it be clothing, mm. food. If they wanted to embroider something, they were probably going to be dyeing that wool themselves. And we're divorced from that. And it takes a bit more to make it ours, to make it special, to make it really resonate with us and allow us to alter our brain waves when we're utilizing it. Um, and my train of thought just left the station. 
Well, I, can I <laughs> jump back to a previous station? Um, I remember you were talking about putting honey on infected wounds. Okay. And uh, I had one of the, I don't have a, I haven't had a lot in my own mind of woo psychic magical experiences. Mm -hmm. But I actually did hear a voice once uh, while I was babysitting, I was nannying. And what, and my baby that I was taking care of had, had diaper rash so bad it was just bleeding. I mean, his butt had lots oh. of little sores and they were bleeding Ow. all over. Yeah, and we tried everything. We tried the desitin, we tried the, the, the E, we tried everything, but then I was in the room alone with the babies and I heard a voice say, honey, put honey on it. And I looked around and there wasn't anyone in the room with us. And that was a little weird because I don't hear voices. As uh, Dorothy Morrison says, I make fun of people who hear voices. Uh, but I, I didn't really feel that it was, uh, I couldn't think of anything that would go wrong. So I went in the kitchen and got some honey and I carefully being who I am first put a little bit on and the kid did not cry and scream and said it st stung. It's really hard when you're dealing with a, you know, nine month old and you don't, they can't talk to you. So I carefully covered his one, one butt cheek, put his diaper on, laid him down for bed. And in the morning got up and in the morning, they had the same bloody diaper I'd had for several days on one side. And the other side was pure, creamy baby skin with just mm. one little pink spot on it. And so we put honey on the other one and, and it got better. Uh, later, I told my mother and she said, oh, yeah, my uh, friends who are in nursing sneak honey into the hospital to put on... Um, to put on, on uh, bed sores because nothing else will heal bed sores like honey. But um, apparently now they allow, hospitals will acknowledge that honey is uh, good for bed sores and so, but they have to use sterilized honey, which uh, I don't know that's. So anyway, that's just a story I thought I'd throw in on the, the honey thing. Well, Somebody I, asked I've me come to the conclusion that honey it's absolutely one of the most magical substance, substances in all of the universe, because not only does it work for all of these things, but I actually just read a research article that I had to go back and read twice before I could believe it, which is that researchers have now developed a new kind of semiconductor gate, which, which consists of two thin layers of some metal separated by honey. And they're talking now about building computer chips out of this stuff because the honey gives the whole thing some very desirable properties. Oh, oh wait a second. Are you, I, I see a, there's a hand. Robin? Oh, Robin has a, yeah. Yeah, can, can I add my honey stir to yours? Oh, there we go. About the okay. Rash. I don't know if you guys know, but I got diabetes and I have the leg sores and the leg blisters to go with it. I mm. tried Golden Seal. I tried a lot of stuff. The Golden Seal patient is fun, but it's gooey green, uh, which did not suit my neighbors that fine. They're worried about me, my uh, mental state. And then I came across Manuka honey. There are the grade that you're supposed to use, supposedly, that they try to promote is the medical grade of a. 15 point to 20 points. Um, I forget what the name of it is. But when I was talking to my wound care doctor and I told her I was using windmill, she says any kind of honey works at all. When you put it on, the reason the baby didn't cry, it dulls and it soothes and it cools mm. the irritation. You would not believe how much it tones down and cools and soothes the mm. irritation. Because my, my interests were painful. And it works better than anything you could imagine. That's my little wow. bit. Would also seal the the nerve endings away from the air. I was yeah. just gonna say that it keeps the air from irritating it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It yeah, a barrier frame, basically. 
<clears throat> and it has a natural antimicrobial. Honey is wonderful stuff. Mm -hmm. um, and when the train of thought left the station, I do remember the story I was going to tell, which was about my favorite um, tarot deck, which is a Celtic deck that I was walking along the roadside listening to music at about two in the morning when I was maybe 17, 18. And I saw a tarot card. And I picked it up and a little further, I picked up another one. And through that walk, Along the roadside, I found all but one tarot card for this deck. Wow. And it felt just marvelous. I could not wait to start reading with this deck. And obviously, someone was not happy with this deck because out the window it went. But for me, it was wonderful. It was like a gift from the universe. And it was just resonating with me so well because that made it special. It was the two of cups that was missing. And hmm. I still use that deck even with the missing card. And it is just marvelous. Now, through all of this... We have spoken a great deal about how science explains away the magic, but we haven't really touched on how science kind of confirms the magic. So I want to spend a couple of moments on something called thermoluminescence, which is used to date ceramics, pretty much anything crystalline. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it... <clears throat> The way it dates ceramics is the silicone, the, the sand, the crystalline structure in the ceramic. When it is fired, all of the energy is released in one big burst. Then it starts regaining energy in the form of electrons. We all know that what electricity is, is it's moving electrons and in thermoluminescence when the energy is released it's released as a burst of light and we can measure that to get a date how long it has been out and one of the ways that things like quartz gets charged with this energy that we can measure is just from being in sunlight you're going to get a more accurate date for something that has been exposed to sunlight than you will from something that has been buried in the ground. Now, as magical practitioners, we have long said that things have energy. This is simply proof that they do, in fact, simply collect this energy. And they hold it. They are, in fact, Mm -hmm. charged and you can charge them with intent and you can release that energy via heat and be that a slow release from body warmth or a larger release from fire science has proven that it has energy so they no longer argue that so when a scientist isn't looking at you like you're nuts when you say that this Quartz crystal has energy, they're thinking something different, but they are thinking, yes, it has energy. And we so frequently look only at the things where science has gone and created a new cancer medication from juniper berries, where they have appropriated magic or explained it away. But there are times when they confirm things like energy with signs. Anyone care to comment? Well, <clears throat> I think it really does speak to the issue that <clears throat> 
Yes, and pressure I, works too. Um, sort of vaguely related to something I'm chewing on in the background, which is science versus religion and science versus magic. And it's the same thing. They really are talking about the same things. They are. And we're all, these are just different ways of describing our universal reality. And to realize that <clears throat> everything has energy. It took energy to create the universe. That energy persists. It exists in everything. <clears throat> and if you're sensitive and tuned to the right channel, which is what it really boils down to, you can tune in. And I know you talked about the thermoluminescence, which I've seen referred to repeatedly in articles I read about how they've decided that, oh, well, we just figured out this thing is 9,000 years older than anybody thought it was. And there are other methods for crystal-based age dating. And again, it's all addressing okay. the same reality with different tools. So th that's my particular response to what you just said. Unfortunately, the error in how most explain thermoluminescence is it won't give you an age. It will give you the length of time since the last time it was heated and the energy was released. So, yeah, if, it's not an absolute baseline date. Correct. <clears throat> but the point that the energy is there to be released is very welcome in my world. By the way, I, I highly recommend Star Wolf's commentary about his corollary to Clark's law, which is any sufficiently advanced magic is indistinguishable from high technology. And, and I think putting the obverse reverse face on that is a good thing. Uh, the uh, last 25 years, they have shown that our whole body is filled with what they claim or uh, call as a liquid um, crystal. And that's basically collagen fibers of water. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I don't say it's piezoelectric like quartz crystal mm -hmm. is, but it does move protons instead. So if you work with quartz, you got a positive charge, you got a negative charge, uh, I mean a negative charge, and with positive charges, you're getting ion, uh, hydrogen ions moving through your body. Mm -hmm. The body's got fascia everywhere. So, um, <clears throat> you know, and it can be stimulated by any method of magic, chanting, dance, postures, breathing, you name it. And... Uh, the fact that it moves mass and charge, um, I don't think scientists have gone to the point where they say, well, that's starting to step into the electroweak uh, forces. <laughs> and, uh, of course, it, uh, uh, Penrose uh, is a physicist working with a neurophysiologist, have shown that the pyramidal cells in our brains... Um, use microtubules and they work at a, uh, a quantum level of uh, communication and they are uh, highly organized, organized and oriented. The interesting thing is, is the step, the cells and the way they step down actually do step down into the uh, 10 megahertz um, they're about that your body is actually reflecting that when you meditate, you get that uh, set of brain waves. That mm -hmm. uh, meditation pract practitioners could take that uh, wave and bring it up to forty to sixty hertz, and uh, and they can actually direct it out their palms, um, and uh, they actually create infrasound. So that you can actually vibrate a person's body by meditating, by having that energy go through the palm of your hand. 
-hmm. So, and if you're vibrating it at that low fre frequency and you've got quartz in your hand, obviously you're creating a piezoelectric effect as well. So you can do it by pressure, you can do it by a charge. Um, and the microtubules operate uh, at a kilohertz or better. Um, they're, they're all through the body. So they can commute, probably communicate just about anywhere there's a nerve cell. So uh, you, you, even the uh, Schwann cells that wrap the, my, uh, the myelin sheaths around your, uh, mm -hmm. your, your nerves. And <clears throat> those things have a wrapping. Every other cell is clockwise, counterclockwise, clockwise, counterclockwise. And that's the way to help step up and, and ensure that there's a higher current rate. Uh, to go through it, but if, if they're at a specific size, you got to you, you can determine a frequency. So um, there, there's there's a lot of good information out there. Uh, the fact that we have biohematite in our heads, like uh, pigeons do, but um, uh, it's all through our uh, there some of our most of our brain, but mostly through our brainstem and parts of our small parts for a cortex. So, um, and they will uh, vibrate between 40 and 60 Hertz. Um, the, the interesting thing uh, about um, uh, the anesthesiologist uh, with the pyramidal cells with microtubulin, they figured there's a, like about a six point something terahertz. Uh, um, it's, it's basically a blue light will actually anesthetize the pyramidal cells. And that's where people's consciousness stopped. Well, guess what? Uh, what paint blue looks like? Hmm. You know why people paint uh, put paint blue on, on uh, in the front of the house to keep the ghosties and VCs away? It's it's pretty much uh, around the same same frequency. So. Uh, that's just something for me to add there. Uh, and I, I, I know that you can alter your, your body by meditation. They found that the vagus nerve, you, you uh, meditate and you do a, a pot belly breath, you actually uh, stimulate your vagus nerve. And that science is well known. They even have uh, like, uh, uh, what do they got uh, for the heart? Pacemakers. They'll have a vagal pacemaker to help... Uh, organize your uh, organs uh, behavior uh, you mm -hmm. can you can meditate you can <clears throat> calm down your your heart rate and your uh, uh, breathing rate so it, that's an ancient science that the that is proven by science today yeah because I remember in the mid 60s when I was getting first involved in meditation and specifically transcendental meditation I was quite Astonished and very pleased to see a book by uh, Dr. Henry Benson, The Relaxation Response. And this was produced in cooperation with Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who did say that, yup, the research proves that's the fundamental basis of all meditation. And I thought it was pretty cool that even that far back, they had nailed the two together. Okay, uh, Corinne, did you, did you have anything else? I noticed we got 10 minutes left. Well, I was thinking that your story about the aluminum foil and plastic wrap was very interesting. <laughs> it's right. another uh, example of plastic being used magically. But I should probably recap that. Uh, this is from um, Serge Kahili King's books. Uh, he would make what he called manoplates or monoplates. You take a piece of um, aluminum foil, put a sheet of plastic wrap on it, fold it over once and twice, so you know over itself, so that you had uh, two, uh, like two layers, three layers, and then fold it again. And that makes it six layers. When you get six layers alternating of the metal and the organic material, it sets up it's some kind of orgone generator. 
And he would, really? he kept a, one of these in his um, junk drawer in the kitchen. And when the kids would come in with a scrape or a boo-boo, they'd slap that on for a minute and then they'd go back out to play because it would do some quick healing on them. Instead of Band-Aids, they used those things. But that was, uh, oh, that was kind of mind layers mind of boggling. organic and inorganic. Uh, mind boggling because you just described from an electrical engineering standpoint, a simple capacitor that stores an electric charge. You know, yeah. layers of a conductor separated by layers of an insulator. Exactly. But, you know, to, to me, all it is is, okay, is it, does it work? Yeah. Is it, well, that's, is, it, is it safe? Does it work? Okay, I'm good. <laughs> and not only that, it works. It's safe. It's cheap. <laughs> Which is another reason to like it. Carenza, did you, you know, I, I, that was something that we talked about, but not here on the show. Oh. Were you just reminding me? Yep. Okay. <laughs> and I think I'm going to summarize my ideas. And one of the things that we tend to forget in all of Cunningham's wonderful um correspondence charts is it's the result of science where he has taken results and seen what works and said okay this is where it goes and unfortunately he did such a good job with these very basic charts and instructions that so many people neglected to move on and anytime we have understanding it doesn't actually remove the magic it just lets us make more personalized choices and decide mm. what we want to use based on what resonates with us and we know that the mind is an incredible thing and it can alter so much around us and so much in us. We touched on meditation where we're slowing the brain waves. The same thing happens with hypnosis. You can do self-hypnosis during meditation and make changes so profound that you can stop pain. I no longer get painkillers when I go for extractions, root canals or anything. It's simply meditation and self-hypnosis in the chair and the joy of freaking my dentist out. <laughs> yeah, that would do it. And bottom line is the more we understand, the better our magic will be. It's not that science is taking away the magic. The magic of ceramics is still there. The magic of metallurgy is still there. Glass, honey, everything that our ancestors found amazing and magical is still amazing and magical we live in a magical world it's an amazing world and the more understanding we have the more so it is not less it's absolutely phenomenal that we can take quartz and make something like silicone out of it, which is so versatile and it still stores energy. It still responds to thermoluminescence. You're going to absolutely mm -hmm. destroy the silicone, but the energy is still there. We have proven that it still has a charge. This is absolutely amazing and understanding it doesn't make it less magical it just helps with the understanding of i can actually use this and we have four minutes left if anyone has any other comments to share well, i just realized that what you were talking about how it doesn't make anything less it gets back to this idea that you can look at something from a magical standpoint you can look at it from a technological standpoint, and then you realize that it's both. It is. Everything is way more than we thought it was. There's no division mm -hmm. there. There's just greater understanding. 
correct. And the mm. greater your understanding, the more efficiently you can use your knowledge. Mm -hmm. That's why I hang out here on Wednesday nights because I take everything I've learned in 72 years of a largely technological lifestyle and in the last year or so, expanded it enormously, but adding all this, these other dimensions to it, finding out that, oh, A relates to B over here and they're really part of the same thing. And it's just been such a marvelous learning experience to find out that I could take everything I already knew and add to it, make it bigger and more effective. And more effective, yes. I mean, my technology is better for my magic and my magic is better for the technology I understand. I, I should think that we would understand science better even the better we understand magic. But on the other hand, if we accept the technology in the, the way that I will use a computer without understanding how they work or mm -hmm. drive a car without understanding the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. Isn't this setting ourselves up for magical thinking that if you, if you don't care <coughs> how it happens, you just know if I push this button, it works. Isn't, isn't that kind of magical thinking? Just, just a thought. It is. Well, absolutely. Mm -hmm. but that's the same same sort of magical thinking you have every time you flip on a light switch Let's... well yeah I mean because I have to admit for all my vast awareness of computers and how they work there's an awful lot about them I still don't really know how they work and I certainly having grown up in a gas station and learned to drive at the age of eight years old know a lot more about cars than most people but I don't think about that when I get in the car to go to Wegmans. I just put the key in the ignition and I turn it. And, and you don't think about trying to be a NASCAR driver? Mm -hmm. I, no. No, I just want to get my dead ass to the grocery store. That's all. Mm -hmm. um, so, but yeah, there, you know, you could do the magical thing. It's like, you know, it's kind of like brushing your teeth. You don't think real hard about the process. You just do the magical thing. Well, anyway, that, that takes us up to, to nine. And so I'm going to turn off the recording. Thank you all okay. for being here. I am going to remind you that Changing Times, Changing Worlds is going to be uh, held on November 7th through the 13th, Monday through Friday in the evenings and all day Saturday and Sunday. Please join us, find us on Facebook uh, and uh, we're we are now soliciting not only registrations but suggestions for panels and uh, workshops and <clears throat> we are uh, hoping to to be able to as soon as we can as soon as we've got some uh, people who have offered us some cool workshops we're gonna start telling you who's coming which is always an exciting time in planning the conference so uh thank you for coming and uh Tell your friends about this. Tell them if they if they're not free on Wednesday nights, remind them that we're on YouTube. So and stop.